Welcome to Thermal Regulation 4. We're doing this series, I think we're going to have six total thermal regulatory lessons. And um, this one I have subtitled Physiological Thermal Regulation. So in this lesson we're going to talk about what happens with the physiology of an animal when it gets, uh, well, when it tries to maintain normal body temperature and then also when it might get too cold and it has to do certain uh, functions and maybe when it gets too hot. And I want to say that these are physiological. So these are basically happening without the conscious uh, interference of the animal, okay? So let me give you two pictures here. Um, horses love to roll around. We all know that. Here's a horse rolling around in the snow. You can see it has a horse blanket on. But when a horse does this, this tells you a couple things. It's pretty healthy. It's not cold stressed. And it's enjoying life. I mean, he's just having fun. Okay. And then I got another picture kind of makes me jealous. Here are four people riding horses in the ocean. And I don't know if you can see it, but there is a horse in the wave there on the uh, second from the left. So there's actually four people out there <laughs> enjoying themselves. That looks really fun. So we're going to talk about some mechanisms Physiological, now I'm, I'm pointing that out because thermal regulation 5 will talk about animal behavior. What do they do with their behavior to change their thermal environment? So this is all kind of, I don't want to say internal because we're going to talk about how the hair stands up. And so it's not really all internal, but it's definitely all physiological, uh, unconsciously regulated um, changes. Okay, let's talk about panting. And of course, the animal that can show us a lot of panting behavior is a dog. A lot of panting. The dog doesn't decide, hey, I'm going to pant now. No. Remember, they do this physiologically, unconsciously. And panting is where you have a lot of air moving across what's called the dead space, dead spaces of your respiratory tree also called dead space ventilation. You're moving air in and out of a lot of the large airways and smaller airways and not so much the alveoli. That's, remember, the lung lesson. Anyway, a lot of panting and, of course, humidity plays a big part because panting is evaporation of moisture. And if the dog is in a high humidity environment, the ambient humidity is very high, then panting isn't as efficient. Because if you breathe in, inspire air that's highly humid, there's really no room for moisture to evaporate in that air because it's almost all saturated. So that brings up this chart. And I'm going to move that guy out of the way there. That chart, that's basically a heat index, sometimes it's called the temperature humidity index, THI. And what it is, it plays off of the absolute, what's called dry bulb temperature. That's the temperature that you would have on your patio on a thermo any kind of thermometer that's outside, basically on the wall. But then remember, on the high end of the temperature range for all our companion animals, after the high temperature is reached, wherever it is, humidity becomes incredibly important because evaporation is the major heat loss mechanism when temperatures are high for all our animals. So on the left side here, look at relative humidity. This is how saturated is the air relative to what it could hold. So let's look at 90 degrees temperature. At 40 degrees, 40% uh, relative humidity, it says 91. 
And on the weather station, they'll say, well, it'll feel like whatever today. That's, that's the feel like temperature. So as you increase humidity, I guess I'm at the 90. If you increase humidity, you automatically start increasing the feel like temperature. Okay. And then at the very bottom, you know, we're going in, we're actually in the extreme caution area. Now we're in the danger, that dark, maybe gold color stuff. And then extreme danger down here when it's 90 degrees and 95% humidity, it's like, it's going to feel like 127. I'm down there. I'm going to be careful. My red laser pointer will disappear in the red uh, color. But this is called the temperature humidity index, THI. Very important when you have animals and people too. It's You've got to be very careful about heat stress. Now I'm going to move that off to the side. And I know we usually talk about companion animals, but I found this illustration that shows dairy cattle. And whatever animal you're raising or managing or have, you've got to know what is the danger zone for those animals. And look at this. Here's a dairy cow, and if the temperature humidity index is between 72 and 78, you already have mild stress. You might say, why is that the case? Well, a dairy cow, and this would be a lactating dairy cow, is making a lot of milk. And I've said in other lessons, that cow will make, can make 100 pounds of milk a day. That's like 12 gallons, by the way. So she's already making a lot of heat internally through her metabolism. And so she's at mild stress, then there's moderate stress, severe stress when the temperature humidity index is, you know, in the 90s. And you can have dead cows when it's above 98, where people and most dogs would survive. So take home lesson, what animal do you have? What animal are you man managing? And uh, do you know when heat stress starts? Next, I'd like to talk about sweating. Well, you should know that in all of mammals, it's really humans and horses only sweat profusely. Of course, our dogs and cats don't really sweat. I know dogs have a few sweat glands on the pads of their feet. I'm not even sure if cats have any at all. The thing is, horses do it great, but dogs and cats don't. So let me show you a few pictures of horses that are sweating. This is pure horse sweat there after a workout. There's nothing added to that. They get a white, whitish, frothy sweat when they do sweat a lot. Okay, here's another horse that doesn't have so much of that white sweat, frothy sweat, but more just pure water. And of course, you know, in contrast to panting, sweating loses water and electrolytes, whereas panting only loses water. And then horses lose so much sweat that this woman here is using a sweat scraper to get off the excess sweat because once they sweat so much it just kind of retains gets retained in the hair and it doesn't evaporate very fast so you really need to help them get the sweat off they did a study in uh, germany where they had different uh i think they had about 16 oh, i guess i'm reading it right now 17 horses and over time they worked them different amounts for a three-hour period but when they worked them for pretty heavily for three hours, they estimated they lost, listen to this, four gallons of water. Okay, so a lot of those horses, let's say, are around a thousand pounds. So four gallons of water, that's 32 pounds of water, right? They lost 32 pounds of water. That's amazing. Sweating, it relies on evaporation, of course, 
And then the drier the environment, that means the lower the humidity, the more efficient it is. So if you're in Arizona, sweating is great. You might not even see it on the horse's skin or a person's skin, but you can become very dehydrated fast. If you're in some state where the humidity is very high anyway, sometimes like, let's say, I don't want to pick on a state, but Georgia and Florida, they have very high humidity, and you'll see all kinds of sweat on people and horses. It loses water and electrolytes from the animal that we're talking about. Okay, now we're going to talk about piloerection. I've heard it pronounced piloerection as well. Okay, so I'll move that over there. And in the human population, sometimes we say, oh, I got goosebumps. Well, actually, that is piloerection, piloerection. Uh, you're trying to trap still air on your skin. And this is a much better illustration than that. It shows when you're warm, the hair tends to lay more flat against your skin or any animal that we're talking about. But when you feel chilly, and of course this is a sympathetic reflex, the sympathetic nervous system tends to do this. Well, look at down here, I'm looking at my red laser pointer. The muscles contract and tend to make the hairs upright during piloerection. And what this does, it traps still air against the skin. The skin is also called the integument, basically. So what you're having is still air is a great insulator. So you're going to insulate the skin from the cold air. Okay, so very efficient, very good thing to do. I've got one more illustration. And here's a guy that demonstrates pilo erection or pilo erection for another reason. You can do this when you're afraid or trying to be dominant, and that's what this guy is doing. But this is still called piloerection. Okay, let's discuss brown adipose tissue, sometimes known as BAT, B-A-T. Well, maybe you don't realize it, but there's white adipose tissue, sometimes called W-A-T, and brown adipose tissue. Well, the brown adipose tissue is found most, most often in neonates, and it is thermogenic. That means it produces heat right in its own cells. White adipose tissue cannot do that. And it's a mechanism for neonates to try to help maintain body temperature. So here is a human infant and the brown area or the gold area maybe is where the brown adipose tissue is found okay and when activated by the sympathetic nervous system these cells can produce heat so here's a neat little illustration a nerve coming down this would be an afferent nerve NE means norepinephrine, sometimes called noradrenaline. That's an older name, but you may know there's adrenaline and noradrenaline. You may know there's epinephrine and norepinephrine. Well, norepinephrine is released at the nerve terminus and is picked up by a receptor and stimulates the mitochondrion that's singular, or mitochondria, to have that cell produce heat. And that heat then can leave the brown adipose tissue by conduction to a nearby blood vessel, and then the blood vessel would carry it away by convection. So that's the other thing in this thermal regulation. Do you know those 
four primary heat transfer mechanisms. There's five total, but when I say four primary, I'm leaving out condensation. Do you know how they work? Okay, now I'd like to talk about the carotid reedy. The carotid here is a main artery that takes blood to the cranium, to the brain especially, okay? They're bilateral structures, the carotid arteries. And we need to look at the anatomy of this structure. So I've got this illustration, which I'm going to use. And then I'm after I get done explaining it, I'm going to draw something because it doesn't quite do a perfect job. Okay. Anyway, <clears throat> watch my red laser pointer. I'm down here on the left side, up by the nostrils, the nares of this sheep. Sheep have a good carotid reedy. Camels have a good carotid reedy. Cats, not too bad of a carotid reedy. Dogs, not so much so. And rats probably don't have any. And probably horses, kind of, not very important for them. But watch me. When air comes in the nostrils, of course it goes through the sinuses and goes down the trachea, but it's bringing in air. And of course, when there's blood vessels in the walls of the nasal cavities, the surface is gonna lose heat to the flowing air, right? That's convection. But the heat transfers from the blood vessel to the surface of the nostrils by conduction. The bottom line is, the venous blood is going to be cooled off. Notice my laser pointer. It has two possible paths. I'm not going to worry about all the names they have here. The path is up this way or down this way. Okay. Now, there's a thing called shunting. Shunting is where muscles can contract, sphincters can contract, and blood can be diverted more one way or the other. So in this case, if the brain needs a lot of cooling, more blood will go this way. Notice the laser pointer. If we really need a lot of brain cooling, more blood is shunted towards the base of the brain. Okay, so let's do this. <clears throat> I'm looking at the upper picture now where I have the word cavernous sinus. That's what this light blue structure is. It's a big area, a sinus, but you got to remember a sinus is either, it's, it's a big area filled with something, but it doesn't have to be air like our sinuses, our nasal sinuses. There's a cavernous sinus that is filled with venous blood coming back from the nasal cavities, and that's this area right here. So the acronym is the VAO right down here. I'm trying to get between my laser pointer. Here it is right there. That's the path that goes to the base of the brain. That's here. And if it's diverted that way by shunting, <coughs> excuse me, then this cavernous sinus fills with venous blood. Okay. Now, if you have venous blood that's cooler, it's going to be cooler than the carotid blood. So here's the carotid artery there, bringing blood from the body, the main body, right? Off the aorta, the carotid. So it's going to be definitely warmer than the blood coming back from the nasal cavities. Now, when the blood leaves the cavernous sinus, it goes in the jugular vein down either side of the neck. Okay, so then 
in this mix, you have a reedy. So what I'm saying is you can see somewhat the complexity in here. It's the artery that branches into many, many, many branches, and then it comes back out as one or two branches. And that's the carotid reedy. Okay, so the reedy. So I have a definition for a reedy. It's kind of long, but here it is. A network of intersecting blood vessels or intersecting nerves or intersecting lymph vessels. But for us, it's the blood vessel. So I'll leave that right there. But you should realize that reedy doesn't always mean blood vessels. Okay, so, so far, before we leave this image, we have cool venous blood that can be shunted into the carotid reedy. And if it does come into the carotid reedy like this, it fills this chamber with cool venous blood that's coming back from the nasal cavity. The warmer carotid artery is sending blood into this reedy and it branches. So it's kind of like the radiator on your car. The air that flows through the radiator is analogous to the venous blood. And the fluid inside the radiator is analogous to the arterial blood. And we're going to get heat exchange through the walls of the blood vessel by conduction. But of course, when blood is flowing, there's also convection going on. Okay. Okay, here's my version of the carotid reedy. Let me explain it. Venous blood flowing back from the nodes, the sinuses. This is venous blood. Goes to the cavernous sinus and fills this whole chamber up with venous blood before it flows back to the jugular vein, going back to the heart. Then we have warm arterial blood coming up from the body, from the heart, called the carotid artery. That blood comes up, but it branches many, many, many times, let's say 100, 200 times. That's called the carotid reedy. There's a lot of surface area. That's the key here. If you're going to do conduction of heat, you need a lot of surface area. Then the vessels come back together and form one or two or three. It doesn't matter right now. I've got it drawn as one. And it goes to the brain. A lot of heat has transferred from the arterial blood to the venous blood by conduction and convection since things are flowing. But there's no mixing of blood. The arterial blood never physically mixes with the venous blood. That would be bad because then the brain wouldn't get a lot of oxygen. So the brain is being cooled by conduction slash convection. But there is no mixing, no physically mixing of the blood. Neat system. Camels, cats, sheep, yes, to a different degree. Dogs, not so much. Rats, not so much. Maybe horses, probably not so much. And finally, I'd like to talk about countercurrent heat exchange. Okay. Now we know heat can flow through solid objects. As soon as you hear that, you should say conduction. If heat is flowing because of a flowing medium, you would say convection. So those two mechanisms are operating here. Let me bring in this great illustration and explain it. Okay, so this is going to be an example of how the testes are maintained below body temperature. Because they need to be maintained below body temperature for proper sperm production. So, here we go. We've got an arterial blood supply. I've got a red laser pointer. And it's a testicular artery. That means it's bringing oxygenated blood out of the body cavity to the scrotum, to the testes. Blood flows this direction. 
but as it flows towards the testes, it's being cooled because the heat is being transferred by convection and conduction over to the venous blood that's flowing away from the testes. Okay, so this heat transfer through solid tissue would be conduction. But when blood is flowing, the heat to the wall surface is by convection. So arterial blood cools, venous blood warms up, but it keeps the testes at a lower temperature than body. And that's called countercurrent heat exchange. It also happens in legs. If you have a horse standing on a cold pasture, the warm blood comes out of the body, but the heat coming, the blood flowing from the hoof is cold, so you want to warm it before you go back up to the core. So finally, here's the list of those illustrations I used. Okay, see you next time. I guess going, it's going to be thermal regulation five. Thank you.